Tonight's Perspectives in Military History lecture is, as you can see, the gods of Diala. Major Gregory M. Tomlin is Assistant Professor of History at the U.S. Military Academy and is a doctoral candidate at the George Washington University, specializing in U.S. Cold War diplomatic history. A distinguished military graduate of the Army ROTC program at the College of William and Mary, he holds master's degrees in history and philosophy from George Washington. As a second lieutenant, Major Tomlin served as the faculty assistant here at the Army War College in the Department of Military Strategy, Planning, and Operations. He is therefore condemned to come back here at some other point in his career. He was helping to write a course elective on America's strategic involvement in the Second Indochina War. His military career includes Field Artillery Command and Staff Assignments in the 1st Infantry Division in Germany and the 2nd Infantry Division in the Republic of Korea. He deployed for nine months as an Armor Task Force Information Operations Officer during Operation Joint Guardian in Kosovo and commanded a Paladin Firing Battery near the Korean Demilitarized Zone in Korea, as well as at the U.S. Forces Korea Salute Battery. While in graduate school, he served as a White House military social aide. The Gods of Diala Transfer of Command was published in 2008 and is co-authored with Caleb Cage. I might emphasize this is his first, but not his own, not his last book. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Major Tom. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you this evening for, for coming to join me. It's nice to see a few people from DEMSPO uh, that I haven't seen in a while. As Michael mentioned, I started my Army career here, and it was kind of unusual being a second lieutenant at the Army War College. But I was here during September 11th, and there was a couple things that I will always remember about 9-11 because they happened here in Carlisle. And one of them was that we didn't have a fence around Carlisle Barracks. And there was an order issued by the Department of the Army that every military installation had to have security. And until they could activate a National Guard Marine uh, MP platoon to come up here, before they could build a fence, they needed security at night. And the security force wasn't large enough. And so the faculty would have to get into golf carts and ride around the perimeter of Carlisle Barracks all night long with a radio. And then if you found a terrorist, you were supposed to call on the radio and the security would come. And my boss at the time thought this was outrageous. He wanted a weapon. And they said, sir, you can't have a weapon. He was a former infantry battalion commander. So he would drive around with his baseball bat. And this is a true story. This is the reaction that we had at 9-11. And something that's a little less humorous is that there was a senior group of ministers and generals from the Saudi military who were visiting Carlisle Barracks. They happened to be here on 9-11. And when they grounded all flights, they couldn't go anywhere. And there was a dinner scheduled for them that evening, and they had tempered the dinner from a larger dinner to just a small group of people who were going to the Saudi brigadier who was a student in the class. His home was off post, and they went to his house, and during the dinner, the Carlisle police came to the door. And two of the American army colonels who were at the dinner asked the police if they could help them, and they said, the neighbors next door reported that the damn Arabs are celebrating next door. And they had to explain that these are our allies. These are people who were already here. They're our guests. But it was that reaction on 9-11 where we're all trying to do something. We're trying to respond, but we're not quite sure how. And the picture that I've got on the board is responding to something that we're not quite sure how, but we're going to try in earnest and we're going to do the best that we can. For those of you, well, all of you drove past the Paladin on the way in. That tracked vehicle is an artillery piece. I'm an artillery officer. I'm trained to shoot those things, and for every Paladin we have in our inventory, we have one of these vehicles. It's a field artillery ammunition supply vehicle, a fast V. It's designed to be about 20 miles behind the forward line of troops. It's never supposed to see the enemy. It brings about 100 rounds of 155 ammunition to the Paladin so they can shoot, and they're well behind the enemy lines as well. And in this picture from June 2004, it is conducting counterinsurgency operations in Bakuba. We are in direct contact with the enemy, shooting at people on rooftops, shooting into palm groves. We are trying to kill the enemy with a system that was not designed for that. And that's why Caleb and I decided we should write The Gods of Diala. We were deployed as platoon leaders from 2004 to 2005, and at that time, you didn't see many books on Iraq. You had several written by strategic leaders, people who had access to grind, people who wanted to have their point of view at the strategic or the political level done. You had journalists writing books. Some of them are very good books. And you had a few books that were out there that was a snapshot on a specific battle. 
but nothing in 2005 had talked about the, entire, the entirety of a deployment at the tactical level for a year. Caleb and I, being artillery lieutenants, transitioning into this rifle role, thought, well, we're going to go ahead and write this book. It should be written. The title itself, The Gods of Diala, is deliberately tongue-in-cheek. Its origins come from our training assignment in Hohenfels, Germany. It's November 2003. We are freezing, it is cold, and we are conducting an exercise in the same area I had been very recently. Two years before, I was at the same location training to go to Kosovo, and these same villages with their minarets that had been in Bosnia, that had been in Kosovo, are now conveniently towns in Iraq. And they were playing music from the minarets at inappropriate times. They were accentuating stereotypes that were completely inappropriate. But the thing that stood out the most is that they brought all of the platoon sergeants and above in the brigade to a fest tent, and they brought in a professor from the Naval Postgraduate School. He held a PhD from Harvard to talk to us about Arab culture. And during his talk to the senior leaders of our brigade, he said that when you go to Iraq, the lieutenant will be the lieutenant of the hospital. That sergeant will be the god of the of the police station. The battery commander will be the god of the town. And he was being a bit facetious, but unfortunately some people thought he was really being serious. There was an opportunity in Iraq, though, to make a difference. By no means were we going to be gods, but we did have the opportunity to work with the Iraqi people. I had mentioned that I was at Hohenfels two years before because I was preparing to go to Kosovo. And in Kosovo, for the nine months I was there as the information operations officer, my job was to synchronize non-lethal effects. By non-lethal effects, I mean civil affairs teams, psychological operations teams, human intelligence teams that would come into our sector and engage the local populace. I would create handbills that I would give to every squad leader who went on patrol with talking points that he could make to the people in the area. I went on to radio stations as a DJ. I wasn't very good at it, but I would be a DJ in Albanian or Serbian, and between Britney Spears and Michael Jackson songs, I would give them these little infomercials on why if you really want to become part of Europe, you've got to stop blowing up the houses of people who practice a different religion than you. And I had experienced that and took great satisfaction from that information operations experience that I was convinced to go to Iraq we would have to do the same. But it was quite evident to me that when I was in Hohenfels, this was something that we were not very interested in. We were conducting combat operations. We were not occupiers. We were not nation builders. And one of the things we did very well in Kosovo is we had these spheres of influence. So if you were a lieutenant, you knew that once a week you would have to go visit the Orthodox priest. If you were the company commander, you knew every two weeks you had to go visit the mayor in this town. And you would come back and talk to the intelligence officer about that and ensure that they were building an accurate report on what's going on. Are we improving or are we having challenges and setbacks? And when we were sitting in that fest tent after that doctor told us about being gods, I, during the Q&A, raised my hand and I asked our brigade commander, sir, where is the list of spheres of influence? We had a very detailed list when we were here preparing for Kosovo. I was actually excited to get to Kosovo because I had seen these Germans playing the parts of these Albanians and Serbians for so long, I wanted to read the real guy. And he said, we don't have it yet. You're right, we don't. And that was a little frustrating. And what I want to talk about tonight is not everything I wrote about in the book with Caleb, but what I'd like to talk about is how we evolved as an army at the tactical level to appreciate that we do need to reach out to the Iraqis. By no means are we going to be gods, but we do have a responsibility to interact with them, to influence them positively. Joseph Nye teaches political science at Harvard, and he coined a term in the 1990s, soft power. And it's the idea of influencing people, not through coercion, not by beating them over the head, but through attraction. It's what I do right now in my doctoral work, is I write about public diplomacy, how during the Cold War we made people think America was much cooler than the Soviet Union. One historian has called it the Monroe Doctrine, the Maryland Monroe Doctrine. We could have done that in Iraq, and eventually we sort of do. And what I want to talk to you about is my role as a platoon leader, trying to figure out what the purpose of our patrols were every day. And then as a military advisor, when I moved into a police station and lived there for five months, living with the Iraqi population, what were we going to achieve doing all of that? 
This is who the book is dedicated to. This was my platoon, a group like Carl in the back of cannoneers who were supposed to be shooting paladins like the one out front, but instead are said, you're going to conduct raids, cordons, searches, you're going to do patrols, you're going to inspect vehicles, establish checkpoints. And they did remarkably well. Jason Lynch, center in the back row, unfortunately didn't come back. But the rest of them didn't have done quite well, both in civilian and in military life. For those of you not terribly familiar with what an artillery battalion does, what I'd like to talk about for just a moment is how we are organized traditionally. Up until 2006, a artillery battalion belonged to this organization called Division Artillery. He was a full colonel and he said, this artillery unit will help someone, that unit will help another one, and that was your organizational headquarters. You have a battery that provides command and control. You have a service battery that's going to fix things when they break, bring you ammunition, cook you food. And you had two, or excuse me, you had three firing batteries with two platoons apiece. Again, these are paladins, these are big guns, that's your focus. This is the unit that I was a platoon leader in. I was in Charlie Battery, I was a platoon leader for one of those two platoons when we received the orders in Germany that you were going to Iraq and you were doing a rifle mission. So this is our new organizational structure. We are now part of 3rd Brigade 1st Infantry Division. Since 2006, the Army has actually taken the artillery battalions and embedded them into the maneuver brigades. But at the time, that was something that wasn't traditional. Our headquarters company continued to provide command and control, but when we got to Iraq, those soldiers would also provide security of our camp. They were responsible for ensuring that everything went well. They were ensuring that people didn't come in and the fire support element that's up there, that's not part of our unit, these are the observers. These are the artillerymen trained to look through binoculars and say, here's the target, pick up the radio and call back and say, this is the coordinates that you need to destroy. Those individuals are still working with the maneuver units, the infantry and the armor units. We did not see them. Our service battery continued to provide maintenance, but instead of dealing with heavy track vehicles, they did a whole lot of work with our, with our Humvees. Humvees breaking in the weather, with all the sand and all the dirt, and of course with all the IED damage that they would get along the way. They also provided us with our food. Our camp did not have kitchens of its own, so once a day they ran a log pack, a logistical mission to bring us food, to bring us mail, and some other odds and ends. And this is the revolutionary thing that was changing, the organization of our firing batteries. Alpha battery was going to stay an artillery battery. It would have guns that we would take with us to Iraq, and when our radars picked up mortar fire, when our radars picked up rockets, their responsibility was to engage the enemy. Now, you can't do that in the middle of the city of Bakuba, but we were able to do this in other places, in palm groves, in dead space in between. One of those platoons was not with us. It was sent out to eastern Diyala, the other side of our province, but they were conducting the same mission. Bravo Battery became Bravo Company. The, th the two platoons became three platoons. So you take your 80 soldiers and you reorganize them. And they received this striker platoon. The striker platoon is a group of observers that are kind of like the cavalry scouts. Traditionally, they are out with the brigade reconnaissance team and their responsibility is to find even more advanced targets that you want to destroy. Well, now they're going to be one of the maneuver platoons that Bravo Company will have. And in my battery, we still had three platoons that were reorganized, but we also had Bradley's. We had an infantry platoon embedded in us. Our artillery company commander was the commander for that infantry platoon. Every day that we were in Iraq, they did not roll around in their Bradleys, but when there were missions that required greater defensive or offensive capabilities, they would have those Bradleys available. After Honefells and a little bit more training and Christmas break, we flew to Kuwait to the Udari Ranges. The Udari Ranges are in the middle of nowhere Kuwait. And while I was out there, the brigade commander came up to me one day and he said, if Kosovo was college for you, this will be graduate school. And it was very different and certainly very challenging. When you're in Germany and you're a lieutenant and you want to take your soldiers to the range, it is a very tenuous process. You have to be certified by range control. You have to have a plan that you brief to a major, old majors. And then you've got to go 
to the range, get into a tower, put up a flag, You've got to get in contact with range control. You have to have an ambulance. You bring in your soldiers. Dare they touch the weapon before God up in the box tells them to touch their weapon, touch a piece of ammunition, clear the weapons. It is a very difficult process. But when you get to Kuwait, it is very different. They say, Lieutenant, you're going to run a range today. And there's going to be a bus to pick you up. And the only reason I know this is a range is that when you drive for an hour in the desert, there are these little targets. And that's your range. There is no range control. There's no threat that you're going to be decertified. The expectation is you run your range. And a range like this, for those of you who were in the Army in the 80s and the 90s, you were very familiar with very traditional ranges. You lay down, you shoot at targets, they're up to 300 meters away. Well, we started with that. But then they brought us in contractors through Blackwater, and their responsibility were to teach us how to engage targets 25 meters away. How do you shoot a rifle with both eyes open? How do you walk and shoot at the same time? How do you kneel and shoot? And the Army at this time started to fundamentally change the way it trained soldiers. Jason Lynch, the soldier who we lost in Iraq, came to us at Christmas, right before we left, right out of basic training. He never went to our mission rehearsal exercise. This was his training. And then he was going to be in Bakuba, Iraq, shooting live rounds. What the Army has since done is very quickly in basic training, they issue you a gun. And there were a lot of unhappy drill sergeants, as you can imagine, about that. But we had to change that paradigm. We had to get soldiers comfortable with weapons and live ammunition. And when you go to a range, it's OK to hold your weapon, not necessarily up and down range. But you can actually hold your weapon at the ready. And we can give you ammunition early. And we can trust you with that. Because every day, you are going to have this with you as you conduct your operations in Iraq. One of the other things that we were able to do is train in shoot houses. The stack team that goes into a building and conducts a raid, live ammunition, live people in the house, furniture in the house. We were able to train on this, and we did this for about a week. I took this picture from a catwalk. I was able to stand on top and observe my soldiers with live rounds shooting underneath me, something I would never be able to do in combat, because as a platoon leader, my job is to be in the street with a radio, coordinating my local security in addition to the people who go in a house. Where is the team bringing out the prisoners? Are we separating women from children? or men from women and children? Are we taking care of people? And that's your role. So I would have the opportunity while we were there to understand what the soldiers do inside. And they did some very remarkable training in the short three weeks that we were in the desert. This was followed by our 450-mile drive from Kuwait to Bakuba, Iraq. Now, to move, we did not have up-armored Humvees. This is 2004. This is the second year of the Iraqi operation, and we had canvas Humvees, and they said, well, you should probably have some sort of protection. So through Kellogg, Brown, and Root, the Army contracted cabinet makers from India, and they built these beautiful teak cabinets around the backside of our Humvees, and we were told to fill them with sandbags. And as soon as we filled them with sandbags, the motor sergeant said, well, that will never do. You're going to drive 50 miles and kill your shocks. Get rid of the sandbags. So we drove 450 miles to Bakuba, with these wonderful boxes on the back that offered no protection but plenty of shrapnel if you were to get hit along the way, wooden shrapnel. This is the Diyala province. Diyala is one of the 18 provinces in Iraq. The star represents Bakuba. Bakuba is the capital of Diyala province. 1.8 million people live in Diyala. 20% of them are Kurds. Predominantly, they live in the north. 40% of them are Sunni. 35% of them were Shia. You would be surprised the reaction I would get if I asked through my translator someone, what's the percentage of Shias and Sunnis in Bakuba or in Diyala? That's inappropriate. You don't ask that question. It didn't matter in 2004 or 2005 whether you were Shia or Sunni. It is something that the insurgency was very successful in exploiting by 2006 with the sectarian violence. But in my view, Iraq was the most secular Arab country in 2004 or before that. Saddam had worked very hard to make religion not important. He allowed more women to go to school than any other country in the Middle East. So things were going to change eventually, but at this time, that wasn't the case. So this is the province that we're going to, and this is the city of Bakuba. Bakuba had a population of 460,000 people. It means Jacob's house. And if we take back the map, I can show you a little bit more clearly the neighborhoods in this city that would become our home for the next year. 
Old Bakuba, Tarir, New Bakuba, Shifta, Mufrik, Katun, Mualamin, Uritz, Mujima, Hoyer. All of these were the suburbs of the city. Some, like Tarir, Old Bakuba, New Bakuba, were very developed, broad roads. Other places like Shifta, Mualamin, were very much the third world. Some of them looked very biblical. Power lines that ran from generators were extremely low, very great hazards for our Humvees and for our fast fees when we're driving through the area. But the one thing that was most striking as we drove into the city was it wasn't the desert like Kuwait. In fact, with the Diala River that runs through the town, you had a great deal of vegetation. They planted a lot of date trees. It used to be one of the top date producers in the world. They also grew oranges there. Uday and Kuse Hussein, in that area around Wader, they had a wonderful stable where they kept their own horses. They had a date plant as well. So this was a lucrative area. It was 30 miles north of Baghdad, and because of its climate and being a mid-sized town, it attracted a large number of government, military, and intelligence officials from the Iraqi government. They settled there either in retirement or their home and family would live there, and they would commute to the city when they were working for the former regime. Task Force 1-6 Field Artillery lived in Fab Gabe. Gabe was a former Republican Guard base just outside the city. It was a massive complex. We used a much smaller part of it that we contained and guarded in the middle. And when it came to how we're going to run our operations, we divided the city north and south. Bravo Company was responsible for the north. Charlie Company responsible for the south. 128-man company for every 230,000 people. But we actually had fewer people than that because these two sites that are circled in red, the Governor's Palace and the Civil Military Operations Center, had to be guarded full time. So one of our platoons was always fixed on these sites. We had four weeks where we conducted patrols, and then we spent two weeks guarding the governor, in my case, and in Bravo Company, they guarded the State Department, who was living at the Civil Military Operations Center. This is the city of Bakuba, and this is the Diala River. These palm groves became difficult for us, because if you're the enemy, there's only so much you can hide in the towns but they actually like to hide caches in the woods, in these little jungles. Maybe reminiscent of Vietnam for some of you. But it became problematic and sometimes we had to do searches there. There would be times that we're on one side of the river and they would get in a boat and cross to the other. But we don't have boats. How do we get to them fast? Can we get in helicopters in time? Challenges that we would have tactically. As you drove into Old Bakuba, you were greeted by the Golden Lady. She's presenting you with an orange. It was the symbol of the city and it indicated for you, this is a city that's prosperous. This is a city that is simply not sitting in the desert, but we have things that we would like to do. So this is Fab Gabe. The 41st Armored Brigade of the Republican Guard had its headquarters here well before we arrived. But the Army was disbanded shortly after the occupation began. And that meant anyone could go in there and help themselves anything they wanted. That's great if you're trying to build a home. That's problematic later on when you find these IEDs on the road, these improvised explosive devices blowing up on you. The rounds came from this unoccupied place where they had large depots. When I first arrived, I thought the place had been bombed. I said, when during the war did we bomb this place? They said, you didn't. The locals had come through over the past year and taken every fixture out of the place. As you can see, every window frame, door frame, any cement tile, anything they could take. Occasionally I would see someone come in with a horse-drawn wagon and they would chisel away bricks from buildings and take them with them. Why not? You're a taxpayer, you paid for this. The government doesn't want it anymore. The army's been disbanded. Take it away, take it with you. As I mentioned, our paladins provided counter-mortar, counter-rocket fire. They didn't drive around a lot, but this is a paladin and these were the, the three that we had that would provide counter-mortar fire while three other guns were out in Eastern Diala, and they would provide the same. For those of us in Bravo and Charlie Company, what was our mission? Well, twice a day, we would conduct a patrol. The time and the location of that patrol constantly changed, and we had varying pieces of guidance on what exactly we were supposed to do on these patrols. My battalion commander laughed when I said we're conducting a presence patrol. He said, you're conducting a combat patrol. I said, but what's the combat against? Because in March of 2004, there was not a significant insurgency at that time. When we had done our transfer 
with the 588th Engineers from the 4th Infantry Division who had been at Fob Gay before our arrival. They said, if the enemy ever shoots at you, it's very rare. They shoot from 300, 500 meters away. They're way off. You really don't have to worry about that. Be a little bit different for us. But when we first started, I said, well, if we're not worried about an enemy, what are we going to do every day? And some of my peers as platoon leaders said, well, what we're going to do is we're going to zip up our windows and we're going to drive as fast as we can through the town, which is a really good thing to do when you've got this much sewage on the streets. Because that means you're pushing that sewage onto a man walking by in his white dishdasha or onto his wife. You're not making a lot of friends. This is a street in Tahrir. And when you drive through that, you've got trash everywhere. You have sewage, the low power lines, cars, lots of people. What are you supposed to do on these patrols? This is the same street right before the transfer of sovereignty, June, 30, uh, June 30th, 2004. The Iraqi transitional government took charge. And right before they, they got all this money, and they said, clean up your streets. And so this is what they did. And it looked really nice for a few months. Those orange trash cans my squad leaders would joke about, they said they were RPG recept uh, receptacles. You can just put in your weapons there. It's like an amnesty box. Um, but are we supposed to be out there on the street? Are we supposed to help them clean up their streets? Are we supposed to tell them what they can do with their country if they want to do better? Here is a group of people on a street in Tahrir. Anytime you stopped your Humvee, they would come and talk to you. But you had to get out of your Humvee. And no one was saying you had to do that. So, like I said, some of my peers would drive around for three hours and come back and say, no one shot at us, and mission accomplished. My approach was this. We would go out and drive for about 20 minutes, slowly, 20 miles an hour or less, and then we would dismount. And I would take the translator who was with me, and I would find people and talk to them. What are you interested in? What are your concerns? And then we'd get back in the Humvee, and we'd drive for another 20 minutes, and we'd go somewhere else, and we would do this over and over again. Sometimes we were in the busy city. Sometimes we were in the suburbs, which were much different. Suburbs which, like I said, they kind of look biblical. But you'll notice in this picture, there's a satellite dish on a house. People are getting information from Al Jazeera's, from other sources. They're watching a whole lot of soap operas coming out of Egypt. People are engaged. People are informed. And we have the opportunity to inform them because we're on the ground. The question is whether we choose to do that or not. In Kosovo, you could not as a squad leader go out and come back without talking to the S2. You had to tell them what you saw while you were out there. I went to CRS too. Sometimes he was interested in hearing what I had to say, and sometimes he wasn't. You can also see from the child in the foreground, he's wearing a baseball cap. That is very Western. And many of the children are wearing Western clothing, like this boy with the American flag. Donated from non-government organizations. Sometimes we would see, receive these wonderful care packages from people back in Pennsylvania. School supplies things that we could hand out at schools. This was a great way to engage, to influence the local population. The question was, would we do it frequently enough or not? When we were not on patrol, we would guard the governor. Charlie Company's responsibility was the governor's office. He did not sleep there. He worked there. He would commute in every day. But for those of us who were on fixed site security, we would stay there for the two weeks straight. And you can see some plywood on the roof those are gun positions. We put them up for shade because our soldiers were up there 24 hours a day. You were on a six-hour guard shift in the sun, a little bit of shade, and you were looking to protect the governor. And down the street, Bravo Company was doing the same thing from the Civil Military Operations Center. There was a value to doing this, though. It was a value that I don't know if we intended right away, but it was our interaction with the Iraqi army. No, wait. We didn't have an Iraqi army yet. We had a different name for these individuals who were put in uniforms. They were called the ICDC, Iraqi Civil Defense Corps. And then at about the time of the transition of sovereignty, we started calling them the ING, the Iraqi National Guard. And by December of 2004, they became the IA, the Iraqi Army. But we didn't need an army but eventually it would become an army once again. And we were assigned a squad of these soldiers who would live with us at the police, at, at the governor's palace, and every day in this picture they would do a cordon for the governor as he would leave. 
Sergeant Douglas decided to join their cordon one day. He asked them, how do you hold your rifle? It's different than the way we hold ours. And he was there, and the governor stopped and smiled and shook his hand on his way out the gate that day. But that's a neat interaction you can have with people. And so when you are engaged with an enemy that will become much more violent, who is going to kill or maim people in your platoons, it is easy to become desensitized and not see Iraqis as people. When you live at this site and you live with Iraqi soldiers, sometimes they become real people again. And that's very valuable because they're sitting on the roof at their own huts. And by the way, if their people did not supply them with wood, then they did not have the shade that our soldiers had over their fixed site location. But you could have conversations with them. We would always feast or famine. They would bring us food for like a squad when we had a platoon, and then they would bring us platoon for two companies instead of for one platoon. We couldn't eat all of the watermelons or cantaloupes they would bring on the days they remembered to feed us, and so we would give them to the Iraqis, they'd take them back to their families, and they'd bring us gum. Soldiers loved the gum, it was better than the chiclets and the MREs. During the Olympics that summer, I remember Sergeant Bordicello taking the television out of our room that we had, putting it outside on a table, tinkering with the antenna so that we could watch the Iraqi game, the soccer game in the Olympics. The Iraqi soldiers came around to watch as well, they brought us tea. Great interaction between the two cultures, very valuable for combat armed soldiers. Well, when we would go back on patrols, one of the major patrol responses we would do is react to one of these improvised explosive devices. A chapter I have in the book on them, I call them the menace beneath, because you couldn't always anticipate where they were. On the 13th of March, 2004, we were getting ready to take over our sector, and Gary Phillips, who was the platoon leader I was replacing, said, come with me, we're going to go watch. My platoon has a task, a cordon, an IED. And on a major highway to Baghdad, Highway 2, there was a 155 round prominently sitting next to the curb in the street. It's on a highway, so you've got all of this farmland around you, so you need to get to the southern side of this to isolate that so that no one's going to drive by it when we send out these very expensive robots. So you take your Humvees and you drive in the farmland safely outside the blast radius of a 155 round, and you put two Humvees on the southern end of the highway. And once your cordon is set, the EOD team shows up. They have the remote control robot. It goes down. It lays a package of explosives. It rolls back. We detonate it. Boom, it's done. The only noteworthy part of this entire day was as I sat there, I watched a mentally handicapped man wearing purple snow boots, and he kept probing our defense perimeter. He was completely harmless. A little bit humorous, because you're sitting out there in 100 degree heat watching this go on. But it seemed like the textbook case. You could write this in a field manual. This is going to be easy. Well, on the 25th of March, one week after my battalion took control of our sector, Second platoon in our company went out on another IED clearing operation. There was a round prominently sitting on a road. They went out there, established security. People dismounted their Humvees. Specialist Adam Froelich took a knee. There was a pile of trash next to him, but the piles of trash are ubiquitous. They're everywhere. Well, underneath that pile of trash was another IED, a secondary device, and that mortar killed him. They had seen our tactics. They had seen how we responded, and so they adapted to us. We would extend our perimeter to 100 meters. We'd go back to 75. We would alternate. We would try our best to deal with them, but it was always the menace beneath. It was always something very difficult, very challenging to deal with. One way we could deal with this was if we could get the Iraqis to call 112. 112 is their equivalent of 911. It's something that the Americans had set up for them. And if they could call the police station and say, hey, there is a truck in front of my house, and it's 4 in the morning, and the guy's digging a hole. That's something helpful. That is useful knowledge. But to convince these people to do this, you have to have effective information operations. You have to effectively influence your adversaries as well as your potential adversaries and the people whom you're trying to build up. You've got to get them to trust their own security forces. Why don't you call the police? Well, I'm afraid that someone at the police station is really an insurgent. He will come and kill me and my family. Why does he think that? Because the insurgency had much better propaganda than we did. And they were throwing leaflets over people's houses all the time. Especially the closer we got to the elections in January of 2005, they were racking it up. And they were doing a much more effective job of engaging the population 
than we were. It was deterring them from doing the right thing, which was letting us know, because they didn't only kill us. They killed Iraqi policemen who would go out there and try to disassemble these bombs on their own. They would kill Iraqi soldiers. They would kill civilian bystanders. It didn't matter. We had to get them invested and believe that this was something important for them. On only two occasions did I escort a psychological operations team out in sector. That large box on top of the Humvee is a group of speakers. This is a PSYOP team, a speaker team, that has the ability to project up to two kilometers away. But more importantly is when that PSYOP team would get out of the vehicle and they would give out handbills or colorful magazines and they would gauge the local population. In Kosovo, every Thursday, we knew that Pojeron had market day. And on market day, particularly in the spring, the soldiers loved to go to market day because they could watch all the Albanian women walking around. But more importantly, the PSYOP team went there because they could hand out these Albanian and Serbian magazines. You have hundreds of people around you. You can engage them quickly. We weren't doing something effectively like that in a city much bigger than Pojeron, Kosovo. This was an initiative I took on my own when I would sit at lunch with my platoon leaders and with battalion staff officers and say, you know, in Kosovo, we had these SOIs, these spheres of influence, and they worked really well. I started doing this on my own. I walked into a school in Tahrir, and this was a slide that I pulled out of my files that I had given to our S2, that I had given to my battery commander. And I said, hey, if you ever want to go back, you can find this school teacher. If you ever get a bunch of care packages and don't know what to do with it, he's got some interests. And if a civil affairs team ever shows up with money, here are repairs that you can do to a school and make a lot of people happy. We had cards like this on everyone in Kosovo. But in 2004 in Bakuba, Iraq, we did not have this. Another misguided effort was that somebody in Baghdad decided that the Iraqis needed a new flag. The old flag was too much about Saddam and they suggested this one, minus the X in the middle. Every Iraqi I talked to said this was an extremely bad idea. The biggest concern they had about it was, they said it looks too much like the Israeli flag. Too much baby blue. Now the person who designed the flag said, well, if you go back, historically these are colors that the Iraqis use. This would be appropriate. It's got the crescent. You should be happy with that. As you can see from this flag I took a picture of one day driving down, People were not happy with it. And it was a proposal. It was never formally made, but there was a visceral reaction to this in Bakuba, Iraq. As a consequence, I believe, of disbanding the army and of not deliberately engaging people from March of 2003 through March of 2004, we allowed an insurgency to incubate. And the violence would get worse and worse. Yes, we had a secondary device kill Specialist Froelich on the 25th of March. But we increasingly were receiving intelligence reports that people were not happy, that people were going to start expressing their anger in different ways. This was a vehicle-borne IED that pulled up next to a bus and killed 68 people. You can see the crater on the ground and what it did to the building. The bus is gone. I was asked with my platoon to go out there and escort a team of people to clean up the bodies. Fortunately, the Iraqi police got there quite effectively. Just started throwing people in the back of pickup trucks. Anyone still alive, got them to the hospitals. Everyone else, they wrapped up and buried before sundown. But the violence was getting worse, and we had indications that it was only going to continue to get worse. The first direct contact we had in my battalion was with my platoon, third platoon. And we were told on the 7th of April that a demonstration was going to appear near the Civil Military Operations Center. And there might be some weapons in the crowd, so why don't you go check this out? So my platoon started driving through New Bakuba, which wasn't in my sector. We were used to the south. And people were on the streets. Seems, everything seemed to be fine. Well, we did a second loop, and we came back. Ten minutes later, all the shops were closed. No one was on the street. And we started getting reports that from the opposite side of the Civil Military Operations Center, they were taking RPGs and small arm fire. And we were told, go back towards that building and tell me what's going on. And so we started driving towards the building, and someone had missed the opening barrage, and he was running down an alleyway with two of his friends to catch up, and they happen upon my platoon. And they shoot three RPGs into the side of one of the Humvees. One of them goes between the door and the floorboard, and the warhead goes through and punctures the fuel cell and ignites it. 
the Humvee is a catastrophic loss. We can't move until we take this Humvee. We don't have incinerary grenades. I'm not exactly sure what we're going to do. But the soldiers do remarkably well in securing the site while we can assess the damage. And I can confirm, I can't haul this out here on my own. We need some help. Battalion, meanwhile, was very interested in something else. Because on the southern side of the CMOC, a helicopter from Brigade Aviation had come to check out what was going on. And someone decided to shoot him down. So the Kiowa took a hard landing in a field just south of the CMOC. And now that pilot was isolated out there in the field. My platoon was immobile, so they sent another platoon out to secure the crash site. Eventually, we got some support and we were able to haul out our Humvee. But the most important thing that I saw that day was the soldiers, how they responded. People began to peer out of houses. People were on the streets. There were other explosions, small arms fire. And yet the soldiers responded quite well. They yelled at people to get off the street. They used hand and arm signals, but they didn't fire warning shots. They weren't trying to kill people. And that was encouraging to see because over the next series of days, we would have engagement after engagement. We call it in the book the Easter Offensive because it was happening during Holy Week. The culmination was the day before Easter. This is where those fast fees, the field artillery ammunition supply vehicles come into play. Humvees could get damaged we still had a few up-armored Humvees, many of them were not, and that's why that particular RPG round was able to go through the door. And so they decided that if you go out there in these armored barns, as we called them, you would intimidate the locals. Well, the problem with these fast Vs is they're nothing like a Bradley. A Bradley fighting vehicle has a ramp that falls down in the back, sites where the soldiers inside can see and they can figure out a little bit what's going on. The turret swivels, there's effective communications and you have those guns and thermal sights, and none of those things we had when we rolled out the gate at midnight on April 9th. And we started driving around, and we certainly found a lot of attention that night. And we engaged as best we could, but I could never stop and dismount because while a Bradley has a door that comes down as a ramp, we have a very narrow door, and it comes up on slow hydraulics. You would expose soldiers one by one out the back of these vehicles who didn't have any situational awareness of what was going on. In fact, when we came back from our three-hour patrol of engaging multiple RPG teams, the soldiers in the back of the Humvees, or rather in the back of the Fast Vs, said, so what did we miss? They had no idea what we have been doing. The only people who had been engaging was the a track commander of the first Fast V. I was in a Humvee because I had to have two radios, and the Fast Vs don't have two radios. So my gunner and the people were all shooting out the sides. And then we have two fast Vs behind us, and again, it's just their gunners. It's hard to maximize fires. It's hard to communicate. We didn't do very well. We might have killed some people, but you're supposed to go clear buildings. You're supposed to go find where the enemy was. And we were greatly limited in our ability to do that. Well, that afternoon, there were reports that even more people were upset. More people would be on the streets. So why don't you try this again? Maybe in daylight with the fast Vs, you'll do a better job. And so at 1 o'clock on the 9th of April, we drove outside of our building, or out of our FOB, and we drive by a mosque. And there are hundreds of men outside on the street. And I don't know what they're saying from the speaker, but this man sounds very violent, very angry. And the reason I don't know what he's saying is all of the translators had shown up sick that day. It was a phenomenon. The night before any major engagement, all of our translators showed up sick. They just didn't show up. So I don't know what they're saying. It doesn't sound good. It's certainly unusual to have 200 men laying prostrate on the ground outside a mosque. And so we drive by another mosque, and we see something very similar to that. No one's shooting at us, so we're not going to shoot back. They're praying, so we're not going to tell them they need to go home. We go back to the FOB, and as soon as we get there, we have reports that multiple RPGs and small arms fire and mortars are engaging the provincial police headquarters, the civil military operations center, and the governor's palace. We are told to go back and engage the enemy. And this time, as we drive by, the same city we had just been through, people in black outfits, pajamas, essentially, are hanging out of windows who weren't there 20 minutes earlier. We drive by the stadium, and I can see the man in the eyes shooting at us as we shoot back. And we drive to the Civil Military Operations Center, and someone inside is calling for a fire mission. He wants to shoot artillery into the city because there's that many people in the city. The battalion says, we're not going to do that. But they give me a task. They say there's a condensed number of people that are shooting out of this small palm grove that's adjacent to the governor's mansion. We want you to go over there and engage them as best you can. Now, one of the guns that we carried on our fast Vs was the Mark 19. It's an automatic grenade launcher. 
And what we're effectively able to do is lob these grenades into the field. And someone who's sitting in the police station on the roof is telling us, turn right, turn left, slow down, you've got it up, down. And they were our observer. We're kind of shooting artillery. And we were able to kill the enemy that were engaging two of those sites. Meanwhile, in the police station where they have 300 prisoners, they lit their mattresses on fire. And they were creating a riot. This was well synchronized. It was across the whole city. I had run out of ammunition and was called back to post to get a resupply and to take ammunition to these fixed sites. So for the first time, our ammunition vehicles were used to transport ammunition. We filled them to the brim. We went out to the fixed sites. Enemy wanted to engage us on the way. I said, our job is to get this ammunition out. We're not going to stop to engage them. We continued. But behind us was our Bradley platoon. Punisher platoon was in the Bradleys this time, and they started finding pockets of the enemy. And as they continued traveling around, they found the enemy leading them to Baritz, that small suburb of Bakuba that is to the south, that's rather isolated. It's around the palm groves. There's only one road in from the north, one road in from the south. And Punisher platoon starts engaging enemy size elements, their squad size. Every time he dismounts and tries to flank them, they counterflank him. And the fighting gets very difficult that day. Specialist Alan Vandenberg is going to die. But he's not going to die because someone shot him. Someone shot at an RPG at a transformer on a telephone pole, and the transformer fell down like shrapnel and cut into his abdomen, and he bled to death. The fighting would go on until 6 o'clock because they ran out of ammunition and had to come home. Staff Sergeant Raymond Bittenberger would receive the first Silver Star in the 1st Infantry Division since Vietnam for the fighting that day. So it was very different from the situation in Bakuba when we had taken control over it in mid-March, just a month earlier. Easter Sunday, go out on patrol again. Quiet. Turns out the reason it was quiet on the 11th of April is that the Imam said, oh, that's the Christian's holy day, so why don't you give him a day of rest? Polite. This is a street in Baritz, the village to the south, which really became the most festering problem that we had. This would become a battalion-sized area of operation for future OIF battalions and units that would come in. Sometimes this became a brigade-sized operational clearing operation after 2007. Baritz, because of its isolation, one road in north, one road in south, made it a great haven for the criminals and insurgents. And it was also great because they could move into the palm groves, they could cross the river, and they could hide a variety of things. In late May, I was asked to take a human intelligence team into Baritz, and they were going to listen to a mosque. And they were going to see what the imam wanted to talk about. And I said, you know, if we stay more than an hour, they will shoot at us. And they said, well, we'll see how long the sermon is that day. And sure enough, like clockwork, at an hour, they started engaging us. We had a fierce firefight. We left the city when we ran out of ammunition. We came back with Apaches overhead, two tanks, and several Bradleys. The enemy had evaporated. They had gone back into the city. How do you deal with this? The only way you can deal with this is a clearing operation. And so the battalion and the brigade staff decided that what we need is Operation Smackdown. The next time that someone engages U.S. forces in Baritz, we will make this a battalion-sized operation, and we will engage and then we will clear, street by street if necessary, to find where this enemy is. In mid-March, Punisher platoon came in the southern route, and they went into the palm groves, and they found people scurrying like mad, crossing the river. They started engaging them with small arms fire. Then someone lobbed a grenade over to the enemy side of the river. And like fireworks on the 4th of July, there was this great amount of pyrotechnics. They had hit a cache of enemy supplies. We knew they were keeping some of it over there. On June 16th, I was tasked to take our company commander to meet with the mayor of Baritz and have a conversation. This would spark Operation Smackdown because at 55 minutes, as I looked at my watch, they started shooting at us. We had outlived our welcome. And so the battery commander got back in his Humvee and we drove out of town. And we spent the entire evening in a planning session. A National Guard Bradley company was attached to us. We were to go back into Baritz the next day. Punisher platoon and my platoon was given the orders to dismount in Baritz and go about a quarter of a mile through a labyrinth like this in the dark to find a guy named Hussein Ali Septi. He was a financier. We had video of him sitting at a chai or tea house, and he was openly talking about how feeble the Americans were and how he was going to kill anyone. And so we were going to go find him, and we dismounted, and we started making our way through this 
Joseph Conrad, Heart of Darkness scenario, and we found one man in an alleyway shooting with an AK-47. He was engaged, and we came across him. It turns out he was Ali Septi. All of his friends had disappeared, but he was there, standing his ground. As we left the city, as the, as the sun began to come up, that National Guard company that was attached to us came into the southern route, and they took over a school. And they put soldiers on the roof of the school, and their job was now to essentially go house by house and start clearing things. Well, they didn't get very far because the enemy became very fierce. And the UAV feed, if you were looking at the activity in the palm groves, was extraordinary. People were coming from the other side of the river. They were coming from the city itself. And what they were trying to do was essentially rebuild the Ho Chi Minh Trail. That's how quickly ammunition was going up and down. Casualties being moved up and down and taken to hospitals. So all of a sudden, five miles away, people with bullet holes are showing up at hospitals. Where'd they come from? Gee, I wonder. Colonel Bullimore, our battalion commander, said, I never thought we'd shoot artillery in the city. And I certainly never thought that we would call the Air Force in. But this is a building that we bombed that day. Operation Smackdown was a much larger operation. Those Bradleys were struggling in southern Brits to maintain the peace. We had people that in the north started building hard sites. My platoon was supposed to go out on another mission. And as we drove down a road, we were told to stop and come back. And they called in a fighter to bomb this building because they were building V-bids in the back. And when the other people came into the building, they found armor-piercing ammunition. And they found a lot more um, RPKs, these intermediate machine guns, than we had seen in some time. But they were destroyed before we went through. And the mission that we had was to go to Brits ourselves. We were going to go to the northern side. Those National Guardsmen had been fighting for a long time in the south. They'd been there for 24 hours. We were now going to do the same mission but from the north. And there was an agricultural building. We were to take the roof. My platoon was to secure the roof. Another platoon secured the perimeter. We had two tanks and two Bradleys. And once everything calmed down, we were supposed to go door to door. We never got door to door. The fighting continued to be fierce. We took mortar rounds on the roof. We had counter-sniper operations. The tanks would go in level buildings. The Bradleys would go out and engage targets. And we did this till the next morning. We were not making many friends, and we were unable to go door to door. The idea originally with Operation Smackdown is about 24 hours into this, the people are going to give up. We're going to bring in the CA teams. We're going to have them do a variety of things that never came to fruition. It was during this operation where Jason Lynch was killed. He was down on a gun. And he was shot again below where our protective vest was. An ambulance was sent down to our position to pick him up. An IED detonated and destroyed the ambulance along the way. So we put him in one of the Bradleys that was there and tried to get him back to the, uh, not to our FOB, but to the brigade FOB north of the city. And unfortunately, he bled out before we were able to get there. This is the sort of information that when you receive it on the radio as a platoon leader, you have to ask yourself, do I share this with the soldiers in the middle of the mission or not? And we made the decision, no, I'm not going to tell anyone. We continued fighting this mission, and we got home that night. It was about 4 in the morning, and people were patting themselves on the back for making it through this extraordinary day, and that's when you let them know the information. And it takes a little while to sink in because the missions keep going and going. Operation Smackdown should have been worse. It should have kept going. But our brigade commander met with the governor and the mayor of Bakuba, and he said, if you do not tell these people to stop this, we are essentially going to have to level this place. Our clearing operation will be much harder. And so they stopped. Miraculously, there was a ceasefire the next day. We didn't have to keep fighting. But part of the expectation to prevent from having to do another Operation Smackdown is to have the Iraqi police and the Iraqi army provide that security so that people are not in the palm groves building caches and doing other things that are inappropriate. Now, if you're in a Bradley, and this is T.J. Greider. He's on the cover of our book. TJ's driving around with his platoon. He's got this wonderful Bradley fighting vehicle. Lots of protection, lots of firepower. This is me and my Humvee crew. We got a 50 caliber machine gun. By about the third month, we start to get up armored Humvees. We carried 300% of our ammunition that you're supposed to get. You're issued so much ammunition, we always carried 300% of that ammunition. This is the Iraqi National Guard. A pickup truck from Mishibishi a flak vest donated by a police department in the United States, two clips of ammunition for your AK-47. No thermals, no night vision devices, no helmets, but what we want is for you to go in the town and conduct the same raids that we would never think about doing without backup support, 300% ammunition, 
flak vests, bulletproof vests, all the accoutrements that are so important to keeping our soldiers safe in Afghanistan and Iraq are not something that we have with these individuals. That's a hard thing. It's a hard group of people to motivate to get to do the right thing, to stay on a fixed site, to guard bridges, to guard polling stations as we approach the elections. And it was up to these two gentlemen to motivate those. On the left, we have Governor Abdullah, governor of the province. No one elected him. It's part of the transitional government. And then we have Major General Walid, who is the chief of police. He's wearing a Fresno, California Department of Police hat because they flew him back for a few weeks to see how an American police station worked. Their police have the same rank structure as our military, and he was responsible for the entire province. I got to know each of these individuals fairly intimately. The governor, of course, had his office where I provided security. The first time I met him, I was absolutely shocked. He spoke English with almost a Cockney accent. He was a dentist from Manchester. But when they were looking for people to come and help rebuild Iraq, he said, sure, I'll come home. Where was the old governor? Where are the other people that were involved? Well, that government had been disbanded because they were all Baathists. And if you were Baathists, you could not run our country anymore. We needed new people. So we have a dentist who's our, now, our governor and General Walid. And in September of 2004, I had to leave my platoon. The Army was promoting me to captain. And I really didn't think there was anything I could do which would be as meaningful as be a platoon leader. But I found out that there's something that is more important than that, and that is being an advisor. My battalion commander sent me to the police station, the Diala Provincial Headquarters, where we had the Joint Coordination Center. And the man sitting with me is Brigadier General Tassin. General Tassin used to be a general in the Republican Guard. But we disbanded the Army. But everyone who understood something about synchronization of assets, planning, execution, happens to be someone who graduated from their staff college. That's what the red tab on his epaulette delineates. And we would hire these people back to work in places like the Joint Coordination Center in Bakuba and around Iraq. This is the police station. It looked a lot more hospitable when I first arrived. It had windows in the front. It had a whole lot less bullet holes. But every month, it seemed, they would add more, more brick. They would take out the windows on the second floor, then the first floor, and then on the left you can see they actually reinforced the wall with about three layers of brick. On the roof we had plenty of RPG holes, we had mortar holes. One of my favorite, only in passing humorous anecdotes, is that one day I could hear this wailing outside. So I go to the roof and there's a whole column of brand new pickup trucks coming out of Baghdad. And the policemen are so proud of their new trucks, so they're they're waving their, their flags, and they've got their sirens going, and their lights going, and they park them in a neat row in our parking lot, and as soon as dusk hits, we get a mortar strike. Takes the tires out of all of them. Damages some of them very severely. This is the police station where I will live for the next five months. Now, when I first arrived in Iraq, this was the Joint Operations Center. The Joint Operations Center was essentially a 911 station. It was reacting to events in the city. In October, when I came back, this is the same room. This is the Joint Coordination Center. Its job is to do more than just to react. It is to plan, it's to anticipate, it's to coordinate assets. And there was a captain that I worked with there, Captain Dan Edwan, who did a superb job. He planned this. He made the seal that's up on the wall. And he had a vision for what this should do. He had built a small one of these in Eastern Diyala, and the brigade commander said, Dan, this is great. You're going to Bakuba. You're going to build the big one for me. And his job was to build the JCC. And think long-term, my job in the center was to work with the action officers. So as we work our way around the room, we have a translator. Our translators tend to be college graduates. They were in their 20s. They spoke English pretty well. We had an operations officer and an intelligence officer. And guess what? These individuals that we had to go find all happened to be former colonels and general officers. It was kind of like working at the War College again. I was the only junior officer in the entire building. We had an Iraqi army liaison. The Iraqi army was responsible for checkpoints between the cities. They did a variety of other operations. Next to him was the police liaison, responsibility for all the cities. A fire liaison, a hospital liaison who I was quite impressed with. This gentleman came up to me right before the elections in January and said, I'd like some tents. 
I said, what do you want tents for? He said, I expect to have some massive casualty operations. I would like to set up some tents outside my emergency rooms. Great forethought from our liaison. And then we also had a border guard. We shared a 127-kilometer border with Iran, and they would surprisingly find a whole lot of Afghans who were crossing from Iran into Iraq, usually with weapons. And they would bring them to our police station, or they'd get interrogated somewhere. They'd try to deport them. They were freedom fighters. And the Iraqis and the border police told me, you know, when you guys invaded our country, the Iranians secured the border. No one crossed. But as soon as they realized you weren't going anywhere, they didn't care who went by. And so weapon systems, freedom fighters, this was their way into Iraq. If they weren't coming from Syria, they were coming through Iran. We also had a conference room, and every day we had a security meeting. I would sit there and take notes with my translator on what they would talk about. And the liaisons would give a report on what happened every day. And in one of the early meetings, I remember the police liaison telling me, I wish that more people in Bakuba would tell us what's going on because it's hard for us to respond. And they would all nod their heads and say, Insha'Allah, Insha'Allah, God willing. And what popped up into my mind was a book written by a former chief of staff of the Army, Gordon Sullivan, who wrote a book called Hope is Not a Method. And God willing that it's going to get better wasn't going to get anything better. And I didn't usually talk much in these meetings. I was just taking notes. I would send this to brigade. But I said, wait, we've got to do better than that. We've got to find ways to convince the locals that they need to help us. And what I'd like to show you is a short video clip that we would use. We would show this to mayors. We would show this to sheiks. When we would try to tell them, you've got to help us out. This is a video that was captured by a police officer. And he was sitting in traffic, and he saw a van in front of us. And the van in front of us, which is this van in the picture, had a license plate that had been reported the day before as having a mortar team involved. So what you're going to watch is an Iraqi mortar team. It's very evident these were in the Army before. And they took a video of themselves setting up their mortars and firing at Fob Gabe, at us at the American base, and then packing up and going away. And the only reason we knew the license plate of this vehicle was because there was a cop who happened to live right behind this, and he took the license plate number down, and the next day he reported it. But the reason I would show this video to people in Iraq is I'd say, count the number of headlights that are behind this. So if we can roll the video, please. <laughs> this is in the heart of Bakuba, the suburb of Tahrir. And if we could jump to 340, please.
الله اكبر That's good, thank you. So they know what they're doing. They have a man with a machine gun who moves forward to provide security. Their faces are masked. Someone works the base plate. Someone lays out the projectiles. The guy with the lighters working the gunner's sight. And they're screaming, Allahu Akbar, as they shoot this. And dozens of cars drive by behind them. And so what I would tell these Iraqi leaders who would come into the police station, I would show them this on our television screen, that same television screen. I'd say, if they called the police station, if they called 112, how would they know which one of those cars made that call? Oh. Maybe their threats are empty after all. That's the sort of trust that the police had to build. And over the months that I lived there, that's what I tried to communicate with these police officers as well as the former Iraqi officers who were running the JCC. Nothing became more important, though, for the last two months that I was there than preparing for the national elections. Diyala province was supposed to have 254 polling sites for the first national elections in over 30 years. The hardest thing to do was to find the commissioner of the IECI, the Independent Election Commission in Iraq, and get him to come to the JCC. He believed he needed to be independent. He was a lawyer, and he did not want to talk to us. And we finally got him into the police station and said, look, when you come in the gate, no one has an idea whether you're talking to Americans or you're talking to Iraqis, and we really prefer that you talk to the Iraqis here in the JCC but you need to start thinking of some things. He says, no, 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 it's okay. I have a colonel from the police. He's attached to us. We're going to do the security. And Dan Edwan and I sat down with him and said, security, you have 254 polling sites. Where are they all? Well, they're schools. Do you know where they are? Uh, well, we'll figure that out. You have two months. We have 60 days to figure this out. And we started asking him logistical questions. How many policemen will you need at every school? How many barriers will you put in front of the roads? If the road is wider, will you need more barriers? And he said, he didn't speak English, but he said in English, to be or not to be? To be or not to be? I said, Hamlet. He says, yes, good, yes, good. And he said, time. I need time. And then he went back into Arabic through his translator saying, we are new to this. Democracy is something we haven't done before. You need to be patient with us. And we said, we'll be patient with you, but we need to help you. This is a meeting that we had where a lot of people started getting involved. We had the Election Commission involved. We had the State Department involved. Sherman Granby is the man standing at the table. He works for the State Department. He was very interested in providing help. The Army, the U.S. Army, was going to provide exterior support, but a whole lot of planning help along the way. Dan Edwan built a new JCC next door. This is not a telebank for PBS. This is something where we're going to put a whole lot of liaisons from all over the province to track the security during the elections. The wall is metallic. They could put little magnets on the walls. They could track things as it went on. The vine of ivy is something that General Tassin added on his own. I walked in one morning. He's there with scotch tape. This is beautiful. Yes, Captain? I said, yes, sir. It's very beautiful. But they were energized about this, and we worked with them through this process. This slide will make your head hurt, but the thing I want to point out to it is 170. We helped them figure out which polling sites they could consolidate. If you've got two of them, but they're within 300 meters of each other, let's consolidate them. Let's put them together. Maybe you have two different entrances, but we helped them build this. The engineers from our brigade were involved, talking to them about what they could do to provide that security and what sort of barriers they might need to in place. Two days before the elections, we went up to the brigade headquarters, which was at an old helicopter airbase. And what they did is set up this giant sand table, and we did a rehearsal. Every police chief in the province was there, and he would stand up with his counterpart, whether that was a company commander or a battalion commander from the U.S. Army, and they would say, these are my polling sites, this is the number of policemen I will have, this is how I will transport ballots from one place to another. And a lot of people were interested. General Batiste, our division commander, we have the lieutenant governor, my brigade commander, General Petard, Colonel Adele, who was the chief of police, Governor Abdullah, Amr Latif, General Head. General Head was the brigade commander for the Iraqi army. All of a sudden, again, we have this Iraqi army that we said we didn't need two years ago. He's responsible for every checkpoint between the cities, and no one's going to be on the road the day of the elections. General Casey flew in to see us on the 29th of June. He was there for the ribbon-cutting ceremony, and he walked in and he turned to General Tassin, the director of the JCC, and he said, General Tassin, are you ready for tomorrow? 
And he spoke about the capabilities of the JCC and what the police would do and the Army would do and how the Americans were integrated. And I couldn't be more pleased. Sitting in the back, no one knows who I was. They were focused on the big wigs. And they were doing this themselves. They had a whole lot of help from us. But when it came time to make those decisions on election day, they were the individuals doing it. This picture of different ballot picture, uh, of different campaign posters was taken by our field agents. I mentioned that we had field agents. And the field agents would go out with cameras and GPSs and they would do things for us. We had to teach them how to do that. So I remember walking around the compound parking lot showing them how to use a GPS. Why was that important? Because I would like you to go out and verify the grid location of every one of these polling sites. We've got the report from the police. We need to double verify it. That's our job. How to use the camera. Take the picture. Does it work right? All right, let's take a look at it. Show you how to put it on a computer. We did all of these things with the Iraqis. And on election day, they did a lot of the work. The American army did a couple of things that day. We transported the ballots at the end of the day to a secure site, that airfield, transported them to Baghdad, but we were not on the polling sites. That was the police. And we were not patrolling most of the roads. That's what the Iraqi army was doing. The field agents could get on the sites. American soldiers were not there that day. And they were taking pictures. People lined up. We were worried that people wouldn't show up for this election. It seemed quiet the first hour, and then it got more exciting and it got better. They brought these pictures back, and I took them and I put them on a plasma screen. We had a reporter there from CNN and a reporter from the Army Times, and they both asked me, where did these pictures come from? I said, our field agents sent them to us. Can I have them? And so these photographers from these other news organizations in America took the pictures from our field agents back home with them. At the end of January 2005, there was still a lot of work to be done. And there were mistakes made after that, and there was a lot of hard effort afterwards. But what we did know at the end of this tour, Caleb and I both, in our platoons, is that by no means of the imagination were we gods. But we, as Americans, had an opportunity to share with them a unique way of life. And if you were good role models, they might pay attention. Thank you for your attendance this evening. microphone, hold it about here so we can all hear you. Questions? I know he covered it really, really well, but surely somebody's got a question somewhere. Yes, sir. It's always tough. Early in your uh, slide presentation, um, I know that dates me slides, but uh, early presentation showed a picture of the Humvee going down the street, sewage, trash, junk. Was that due to the war or is that just the way most of the big cities are, poor trash collection? That was the way it had become because this was March or that was late March when I took that picture of 2004. It had been a year since they really had services within that city. So was there as much trash on the road if you were there in 2002? Probably not because you had a functional government. That was something that was absent at that time. It allowed the trash to collect. There were plumbing issues. A lot of places still didn't have sewage. It would just flow onto the streets. That was natural. But the amount of trash that was there was indicative of what happens when you take away the infrastructure in the provincial government. That's why at Fob Gabe, everything was removed by the locals. No one was there to say no. No one's going to find you if you take trash and just dump it outside. You don't want it right in your home, and no one's coming to pick up the trash because we don't have government services. Put it in that median in the road. Yes, sir, over here. Yes, sir. You were uh, talking about using the 155 gun for counter fire to a mortar. How do you do that? How do you get that 155 elevated enough to run over there and drop on that mortar site? Mortars are usually a pretty well close in. Yes. And initially when we arrived, the mortars were basically sitting right outside our FOP. And they were, or they would be about 10 kilometers away at the most. But you're right, they're not very effective the further away you go. But the reason that they would do that is they didn't want to be by the cities. Initially, the insurgents were afraid that if they were in the city like you saw in the video, someone will report that. Well, we would use the 155 rounds when it was applicable. And surprisingly, it was quite often. 
most of the mortar rounds and rockets were not fired at our base. They were fired at the brigade headquarters north of Bakuba. And it was very easy for us to range that because that was such a short, or that was a much longer range. What the Iraqi insurgents decided, though, is we were actually killing mortar teams and rocket teams who were out in the palm groves, who were out in the, in the desert, and so they started moving into the cities like in that video. And then we weren't going to use artillery there. Yes, sir. Question. I saw the uh, one uh, slide that uh, had the uh, street sign on there for uh, Mosul. Was this type of operation in place at Mosul also? It's a great question because I remember when I was working at the JCC being brought into Bob Gabe for meetings when someone would come in from division and our battalion S3, our battalion XO, loved to say that Bakuba is not Mosul. Bakuba is not Fallujah, because in Fallujah at this time, when things got violent, like during our Easter offensive, they simply stepped out of the city, and it enabled them to build a much greater infrastructure, and it made it much harder. We, in our brigade, even in our battalion, sent troops to support the Second Battle of Fallujah. Maybe that wasn't necessary if they stayed in it. It's clearly not comfortable to stay in a city when it's dangerous like that. But in Mosul, at that particular time, and other times it would be different, it's based on brigade commanders, battalion commanders' intent. Uh, at that time, it was not as robust as what we had. Yes, sir. Thank you for talking us through the modification made to the organic structure to make it suitable for this mission. My question is, when you returned uh, to the United States, did you revert to your original configuration? or did you remain tailored for combat? In our particular case, we returned to Germany and were told we were, re were inactivating. First Infantry Division would reflag within a year and go back to the United States. So in our case, we spent four months with nothing really to do other than turn in equipment and prepare to come home. But the question you ask is very important because for a lot of units, once we started to increase with the surge and take our Afghanistan more seriously, you knew that when you came back from Iraq, you were going back to Iraq within a year. And so the sort of training that you would do would be training that was similar, built on the lessons you learned. You would have new commanders come in, new soldiers, new NCOs, but they had come from other units that had also been deployed. And it posed, in a way, particularly as the Army downscales and we end the deployment in Afghanistan, a challenge because you have soldiers who fought very capably as engineers, as artillerymen, as armor people, and made the ranks from private to staff sergeant, even sergeant first class and they never did their job. I was a battery commander for 2nd Infantry Division in Korea. We pretend the Cold War still goes on there. And everything we do is about paladins supporting maneuver forces, and that is the conventional artillery mission. I would have section chiefs come to me, and they hadn't been on a gun since they left basic training or the advanced individual training. Smart NCOs, but they had as much to learn as our specialists did or our privates first class. And it's a challenge that the Army will have, but for those people who were going continuously back to Iraq and Afghanistan, they were served much better by continuing to focus on that unconventional mission. Time for one more. As a platoon leader, of course, you knew a great deal about the Army from your perspective. What was your assessment that time of, of the field grade officers in battalion the operations officer, executive officer, and your battalion commander, not to personalize it, but did, did you find that the transition that you were forced to make and have been ordered to make and you know, your adaptations, did they understand the extent of the challenges or how were they dealing with that having been up until then cold warriors? I think a great deal of it was reactionary as well. It was reactionary at the brigade and clearly at the division level. Uh, our field grade officers were wonderful in my battalion. All three of them have made full colonel. Two of them commanded brigades. Uh, our brigade commander, he's a division commander right now. So these are capable officers and they've learned to adapt. But they were learning a great deal. What was most frustrating for me is that in the case of a lot of the senior leadership, they were allowed to stay for a third year in command for continuity purposes. It just happened that they were about to change command as we were deploying to Iraq. 
And we had so much institutional knowledge from, from Kosovo on what to use. And I expected to see that again. And when I didn't see it there, it was evident to me that was because that wasn't the division focus. That wasn't the core focus. And when you read accounts of what was happening in Baghdad at the time, um, you see that it took them some time to accept that this is the mission that we were supposed to do. Yes, sir. Greg, if you could step up here. We got something for you. Come on over here. Still on stage for a second. Well, Major Tomlin, we ask each of our, our historians, our speakers who uh, join us here in the Perspective Series to enlighten us a little bit about what the life was like for soldiers during the period on which they are experts. And every once in a while, we have an opportunity to speak to somebody who is both a historian and a veteran. And I think what you have done is you've given us all a much greater understanding of uh, the war that we've been experiencing at various uh, distances for the last uh, 10 or 11 years. We really appreciate the opportunity to learn a little bit about that part of the war from your experience, at least the, the Diala part of the war in 2004. And uh, we wish you the best, and thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, sir. Thank you. This is a uh, reduced copy of the poster that we used to, uh, to uh, advertise your lecture, and we... Uh, present that to you on behalf of our director, Colonel Matt Dawson, who unfortunately can't join us tonight. He's TDY uh, down the badlands of D.C. But uh, from us and all the staff of the Army Heritage and Education Center, we really appreciate it. You've also uh, offered us a unique opportunity. Um, I've been associated with this series for about 10 years now, and I've never had a speaker who brought his mom to the lecture. It's really, <laughs> really great. And on her behalf, I'd like to thank you for telling her what you were doing during that period of time because she related to dinner how, how, how few times you called home. So 